Let me pray and then you can take a seat. Um, Our gracious Heavenly Father, as we turn our minds to Psalm 37, we pray that you might speak to us clearly through your word, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. As our society becomes more secular, it's getting harder to be a Christian. There are things a generation or two ago Australians would have dismissed as being unchristian, but now they're largely accepted as normal. And this can leave us feeling like those who have no regard for God are somehow gaining the upper hand. That in the culture wars that are happening in our society, God is no longer on the winning team. When this happens, there are two temptations that we face as believers. There's the temptation to panic and the temptation to envy. Psalm 37 is about what we should do when people who don't care for God seem to be winning. It speaks of the wicked uh, all the way through that, at that psalm. You would have heard about the wicked. And it means those who have no regard for God. So what do we do when we're envious of wicked people who seem to be living on Easy Street and we wish that we lived in their location? What do we do when godless people are setting the tone of our culture? Well, Psalm 37 says that there are three things that we need to know and one thing that we should do. The three things that we should know is we should know where our future lies, verses 1 to 11, We should know that God is not idle, verses 12 to 20. And we should know that God will never forsake us, verses 21 to 33. And we'll come back to what we should do in a moment. Psalm 37 says that when we are envious of the wicked, know where your future lies. Verse 1, do not fret because of the wicked. Do not be envious of wrongdoers. Uh, Well, let me ask you, what would it be for you if you were to be someone who was to envy the wicked? What would it be for you? Would it be maybe maybe the moral freedom that they seem to enjoy, that without God, there's no rules to live by, no guilt to feel about getting things right or wrong? Or could it be maybe lifestyle? Wide open weekends with no church commitments, no family of believers to care about, Imagine a world with no rosters, where where your free time was never taken away because someone wrote your name in the roster. Could you imagine that? Would that be the dream? Or would it be their prosperity and their success? Or maybe their ambitions that can just run wild without needing to be checked in any way? What would it be for you if you were to envy the wicked? Well, straight away in verse 2, we're told why it's not a good idea to be people that envy the wicked. Do not fret because of the wicked. Do not be envious of wrongdoers, for they will soon fade like the grass and wither like the green herb. With the grass around Armadale at the moment, it's, it's green, it's lush. We just got back from holidays and there was a lot of mowing to do. And I've got the feeling that for the next few weeks, it's going to be a week by week thing keeping on top of the grass. But we know that it's only a few dry months away from the grass being over, its glory fading and withering as winter comes. And verse 2 says, that's the future of those who have no regard for the Lord. That they get one really good summer, but as soon as the cold comes, it's gone. And verse 2 says to the person who wants to have what the wicked has, Take a good look at where it leads. Would you really be happy with a life free of moral responsibility if it was only for one summer? And this theme of the wicked being brought to nothing, their pursuits going up in smoke and them being held accountable to God, it runs all the way through the psalm. Verse 10. Yet a little while and the wicked will be no more, though you look diligently for their place. They will not be there. Verse 20. But the wicked perish and the enemies of the Lord are like the glory of the pastures. They vanish. Like smoke, they vanish away. Verse 35. 
I have seen the wicked oppressing and towering like a cedar of Lebanon. Again I passed by, and they were no more. Though I sought them, they could not be found. Would you really be glad to trade everything that Jesus has done for you, his forgiveness, his love, the security that the cross gives for one summer? Would you really risk putting yourselves outside of the grace of God for some Instagram moments, for some memorable shots that you could put up on Facebook? You see, when you think about it from that perspective, and that's the perspective that Psalm 37 is coming at, Well, it seems like there's more to be lost than there is to be gained. It just doesn't seem like it's worth it. So if there's no future for the wicked, then where does our future lie? Well, that's where we come to verses 3 to 7. Trust in the Lord and do good, so you will live in the land and enjoy security. Take delight in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your hearts. Commit your way to the Lord, trust in him, and he will act. He will make your vindication shine like the light and the justice of your cause like the noonday. Where does our future lie? Well, according to these verses, it lies in what God will do for us. And I think that tends to be a backflip on the way that we think about our future. We can think that our future is wrapped up in a a combination of the decisions that we make and the wisdom that we apply, the the effort that we put in, and, and hopefully with some good fortune, we hope that we might end up somewhere, maybe in the vicinity of where we want it to be. But no, the psalm says that our future is in God's hands. He's the one who does all the willing in this psalm. He's the one who will give security who will give us the desires of our hearts, who will take up our cause and vindicate us. He's the one who does that. And it shouldn't surprise us, because this really is the gospel. Our future is not tied to the work that we do, but to the work that Jesus did on our behalf. Our future hinges on the one true sacrifice for sin that he offered when he gave his life up. And Psalm 37, much like the New Testament says, our future is in God. So be people of faith, be people who trust in the Lord, be people who commit all of your ways to him, for there is no other way. Well, the verses 1 to 11 are about dealing with the envy that we might face. Verses 12 to 20 speak to what we should do when we panic because of what the wicked are doing And verses 12 to 20 tell us that we should know that God is not idle. Pick it up with me at verse 12. The wicked plot against the righteous and gnash their teeth at them. Well, that would make you panic, wouldn't it? And verse 14. The wicked draw the sword and bend their bows to bring down the poor and needy to kill those who walk uprightly. That's frightening. That would strike fear within your heart. You see, no longer are the wicked people nice people who just want to do their own thing without God. Here they are people who are on a campaign to bring about the destruction of believers. Here they're people who want to stamp Christianity out. Um, Now, obviously, this is a portrayal. It's not talking about every single person who has no regard for the Lord. But it does speak to the situation where a believer is attacked for their faith. And maybe you know that. Maybe you know the antagonism of a workplace or the unfair accusation of a friend. In some parts of our world, being a Christian is dangerous and being vocal about your faith can land you in prison or mean death. Persecution, the persecution of God's people, it's not a new thing. And Psalm 37 here is speaking very plainly about it. Um, Just before Christmas in Sudan, there was a Presbyterian church that was burned down by a mob from a neighbouring village. And and you can imagine the excitement this church family must have been feeling. It was Christmas time, all the little kids gathered around, waiting for Christmas to come, excited to get along to evening church and what the rest of the night would bring. And then some people 
who plotted against them came along and burnt their church down. Two weeks later, these believers are gathering in the burnt out shell of their building. They found a little corner that hadn't fallen. And so the mob down the road hear that this is happening again and they come and destroy the building completely this time. How would you feel if that was your church? I think there would be panic in my heart. How can we feel safe again when they're capable of this and they're just over there? Well, no doubt these believers are rattled and Psalm 37 speaks to people in situations like this. What will it be that will help them to keep going on living bravely for Jesus? Where is it that they will find their hope when wicked people stand against them? And the the stream of consciousness in verses 12 to 20 is saying to these people in this situation, God's not idle. He's not sitting on his hands inactive. He's not biting his fingernails, wondering what he should do. He's not worried about the situation and feeling powerless. God is not idle. You see, if you finish those sentences that I read to you, you see that it's actually something he's in control of. Verse 12, the wicked plot against the righteous and gnash their teeth at them, but the Lord laughs at the wicked, for he sees their day is coming. God can laugh, because he knows that even though they might feel like they can do whatever they want and get away with whatever they want, he will sweep them away in his judgment. They won't slip through the fingers of his justice. And verses 14 to 15 speak about the way that that God will return their terror back on them like a boomerang. And then verse 16, better is a little that the righteous person has than the abundance of many wicked. For the arms of the wicked shall be broken, but the Lord upholds the righteous. Well, how might that image help you that if you're part of this Sudanese church? Uh, You can't do much with two broken arms. In fact, I'd say you're pretty much powerless, aren't you? Your ability to harm other people and even your ability to defend yourself has been taken away. And here's a promise for these people that God will render them powerless, that he loves his people too much to just sit there and to be idle. But the day of justice will come. They will experience his wrath and his displeasure. Well, of course, the question that everyone asks is when? When will this happen? And we're not told. We're not told if it'll be next week or next year or five years. We're not told. But we are told that they will perish. And we are told that their day of judgment will come like it does for everyone else. When Christ returns, everyone who has stood against the people of God will meet their match once and for all. And isn't that what every persecuted believer longs for? For the return of Christ? For for, it'd be wonderful to be set free from my own personal persecution, but if my friends down the road are suffering at the hands of someone else, well, can I rest easy? No, at the return of Christ, God will bring all of the injustices to an end. And that's the promise that we must hang on to when we feel the antagonism of a world that is hostile to God. Well, if verses 12 to 20 are about what will happen to the wicked, verses 21 to 33 are about the way that God will sustain his people as they go through this. And they say to us that third thing that we need to know, no, you will never be forsaken. Verse 21, The wicked borrow and do not pay back, but the righteous are generous and keep giving. For those blessed by the Lord shall inherit the land, but those cursed by him shall be cut off. Our steps are made firm by the Lord when he delights in our way. Though we stumble, we shall not fall headlong, for the Lord holds us by the hand. If you've got the impression that the righteous are the sort of people that never waver in their faith, persecution comes to their town and they're the only ones that are not panicking 
that when the glittery things of the world are before their eyes, they're never tempted to go after them. If that's your understanding of the righteous in this psalm, then it's not accurate. Because verse 24 says that the righteous stumble. You see, the Bible is entirely realistic about our capabilities as people. It recognises our weaknesses and our inconsistencies, our sinfulness. It knows that even our best attempts can so often be flawed. But the wonderful promise here is that even if we do stumble, God will never abandon us. And I think that's actually good news for us when we stumble and for our friends, because when you stumble, you might feel like you've fallen beyond the grasp of God into a future without him. That your fate is now the fate of the wicked. And it could be so easy to feel that way, couldn't it? The Sudanese believer, rattled by what's happened, out and about, putting their life back together, and they meet someone in the marketplace who who asks, uh, are you someone who goes to that church? Are you a Christian? And, well, it, it triggers some awful memories for them, and they find themselves in that moment saying, no, 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 I don't go to church. No, I I don't know Jesus. And then as they walk away, the guilt kicks in and they feel horrible. My Lord, he died for me and I treat him like this. And they start to wonder, maybe I've fallen so far beyond the grace of God that there's no way for me to come back. But verse 24 is a wonderful promise. Though we stumble... We shall not fall headlong, for the Lord holds us by the hand. God will never let his people slip beyond his grasp. And what a relief that must be for the person who struggles to be brave for Jesus. What a relief when we find ourselves drifting after the things that are so worldly. God knows that we will stumble. He knows that we'll go after the wrong things. But none of these things will ever mean that he'll loosen his grip on us. Well, it's hard as we read verse 24 not to see the work of Christ in these verses. Though we stumble, we shall not fall headlong, for the Lord holds us by the hand. Uh, It's about justification by faith. It's that idea that we often speak about, about the way that Jesus on the cross took our sin away from us. But something else actually happened when Jesus took our sin away from us. He actually so bound himself to us in such a way that our relationship with him can never be broken. It's as if God decided to use permanent marker. Uh, We see it in Romans chapter 8. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And Paul finishes that chapter by saying, there is nothing in all creation that will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. It's this inseparable bond that God secured for us on the cross that really is the key for us being able to go the distance with God. We will stumble time and time again. We live in a culture that wants to sweep us away in its tide, a culture that wants us to lose our footing and to travel downstream with it. And there will be times when we find ourselves drifting. But Psalm 37 says that no matter how strong the current, God will not let his people be swept away with the wicked. So where have we been and where do we go from here? Well, we've seen that there's always a temptation to panic and the temptation to envy. And we've seen that the way to face these things is to know three things. It's to know where our future lies, to know that God is not idle, and to know that he will never let us slip from himself. And that leaves us with one thing to do, just one thing, and it's to play the long game. It's to stick at it, it's to wait it out until God intervenes and does what he promises that he will do. And that's the way the psalm ends from verse 34 onwards. Verse 34, wait for the Lord and keep his way and he will exalt you to inherit the land and you will look on the destruction of the wicked. 
The salvation of the righteous is from the Lord. He is their refuge in times of trouble. The Lord helps them and rescues them. He rescues them from the wicked and saves them because they take refuge in him. If we learn anything from this psalm, we learn that our salvation from sin and death rests in God's hands. But not only our rescue from salvation from sin and death, but also our deliverance from evil and wicked people, from a crooked and depraved generation. God's way for us is to be people of faith who play the long game, people who keep committing ourselves to his care and trusting him and doing what he says we should be doing. And maybe it feels like a bit of a cop-out to play the long game, that, that while we're sitting around and waiting, evil and wicked people are getting on with their agendas, bringing about their own kind of destruction, But this is the way that God has always delivered his people. Think about the Israelites working their fingers to the bone in Egypt and thinking that after 400 years, maybe God was never coming for them. And one day he did. Think of King David being hunted by Saul, living that nightmare of an army coming after him, thinking it will never end. And one day it did. Think about the people in exile longing for the Messiah to come and another generation passes and another generation passes and then Christ comes and secures eternal redemption for his people. The way forward will always be to play the long game, to entrust ourselves to the care of our Heavenly Father because God is the only way to live through a crooked and depraved generation And he's also the only way out of it. Let me pray for us. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we can often be in difficult times in a world that has turned its back against you. Please keep us in Christ. Uh, Keep writing um, our name upon your hearts. Keep reassuring us that your love for us is permanent. Keep giving us the strength to do what is right, even though evil is so pervasive around us. And help us to be people who wait for the return of the Lord Jesus. Have compassion upon our brothers and sisters who are in places where persecution is severe. Keep them close to yourself and let them know that your hand is always upon them. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.